Joining us now in the studio is Dr. Chris Broyhill. He's founder and CEO of AirComp Calculator. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. It's great, great to see to you. Here. How are you feeling about day one? It's, it's pretty exciting. A lot of activity here. The keynote speakers were especially engaging. Mm -hmm. and. It's just, uh, you can feel the, the energy in the air. It's nice. Yeah, it it's really, really nice. does feel fantastic. So we have a lot that we want to talk to you about, and I want to begin with what are some of the challenges that you see or that are top of mind for you in this industry? Well, so retention and compensation are the space that I spend a lot of time in. I've, mm -hmm. throughout the history of my career, I have uh, was in the Air Force for 20 years, and then I came into business aviation. I've held a lot of leadership positions. And over the last five or six years, I've been involved in consulting for both retention and for compensation, and the dynamic is definitely changing. Mm -hmm. Since about 2017, the airlines really began to ramp up their targeting of business aviation professionals for hiring. Mm -hmm. And that continued to escalate till about 2020. Then obviously the pandemic hit, and you would have thought that the pace slowed down. Well, the airlines went down a little bit, and then it came up a little bit because the traveling public rebounded much more quickly than I think anybody anticipated. Yeah. So now the airlines are hiring like crazy. Business aviation um, organizations are having difficulty retaining their personnel because the airlines are beckoning. And so what happens is a pilot or a mechanic may not leave a business aviation operator to go directly to the airlines, but somebody from another operation might, and then that operation has to hire and they poach another person. So it's a very dynamic environment. And I think a lot of, uh, as the pace of business aviation itself has ramped up considerably post-pandemic, we discussed earlier about how you know, out of the pan pandemic, a lot of people who were you know, on the fence about whether they were gonna buy an airplane or not bought an airplane, if for no other reason, to capture that secure enclosed environment. So that generated a lot more demand for airplanes, a lot more demand for crew, and further complicated the situation. So I think organizations trying to decide what the right things are to do you know, for their people's quality of life, for the culture of the organization, and for the compensation piece, are going to are challenges and will continue to be challenges for for a discernible period of time. It's not going to go away anytime soon, I don't think. Yeah. Do you see any solutions to those challenges? Uh, it's we we were having a discussion yesterday in one of the symposiums I sat in on, and uh, the thing that I think that we see is is that particular pilots are concerned, and I'm a pilot, so I speak pilot probably better than anything else. Although I work across a host of different positions. Um, the demand for pilots theoretically is going to be like 600,000 over the course of the next 20 years. We are not generating on an annual basis anywhere near that much. The armed services aren't generating the pilots they used to. The barriers to entry in terms of the cost to get through to get all the ratings necessary to be a pilot are, are substantial. So I think we're going to be in this position for a considerable period of time. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So you also are an innovator and is there something you're working on now that you could tell us about? Well, so the the air comp calculator is an innovation that I built. Um, in the space, compensation, as I'm learning, as I get deeper and deeper into it, is, is kind of an arcane field. You know, in HR, you've always got the compensation people and they sit alone in the back somewhere with their green eye shades on, yeah. trying to think about what they're going to do. And um, so I had to kind of delve into that space a little bit. And what I discovered was that there are a lot of compensation people, particularly those who work for corporations, that don't understand the way aviation works and don't want to do the detail work necessary to understand what that pay looks like. Additionally, on the other side of the fence, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. <laughs> on the other side of the fence, you've got the aviation managers and the aviation professionals that desperately want to understand what's the right thing for us to do compensation-wise. So I developed over time a scientific methodology. I'm a PhD, so I've got a, a background in statistics to delve into the compensation surveys and pull information out statistically and generate a scientific compensation range that's easy to understand. So now anybody can just determine, hey, what should I be paid for this job, flying this airplane in this location? They can go online, they can type in a few parameters, spits it right out, and they have data at their fingertips that they didn't have before. So that's the initial innovation. And from that point forward, I'm just looking at ways, I'm always playing with it, trying mm -hmm. to find ways to refine it and make it better. Um, for example, yesterday when I, it generates, the calculator generates online reports for people. So, but somebody said in the symposium I was in yesterday, you know, bosses take their reports in a different format than normal people do because they want to have all the recommendations up front. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, bingo, I need to generate a different report format so somebody can check and say, I want the boss report, please. And it generates a different report that formats the information differently. So if they're going to <laughs> present that information to somebody in the 
food chain, if you will, mm -hmm. that information will be packaged appropriately. So yeah, it's, it's, and it's fun to do. I'm really having a blast. Whoever thought former fighter pilot would end up being a comp geek, I love it, yeah. I love it. It's a good transition. Yeah, that's right, that's so right. So let's talk about safety for a few minutes here. Are you, what safety concerns are you seeing and what kind of possible solutions are you seeing to those right now in the industry? Well, so given the space I look at, um, what concerns me, there, there are two things that concern me. The first thing that concerns me is vis-a-vis -vis the retention and compensation discussion we're having. We're generating a lot of turnover in aviation organizations today. Uh, when I was in the symposium I was in yesterday, a small operator symposium, had a room full of people. They asked a polling question. They said, Has it, what, have you seen turnover in your organization in the last 12 months? 60% of the people said yes. Mm -hmm. So when organizations turn over, the culture of the organization changes, the experience level of the organization changes, the new people that come on board have to be indoctrinated into both the machinery if they're not familiar with it, the aircraft or the, the, the ground support equipment. Mm -hmm. They need to be taught how to operate it. They need to understand the way the organization works operating or flying that machinery. And that creates, you know, it basically it's a, it's a less than perfectly safe environment. It's not unsafe, it's just not as safe as it could be. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing is I think um, we're really gonna have to look hard at experience levels that we demand for people flying airplanes. The airlines are already doing that. They're trying to, to strip off uh, young men and women that come out of pilot training with 1,500 hours and put them right into airline cockpits. And that's great because they've got very regimented training programs to get them to the level of proficiency they need to get to. In business aviation, we're not quite so structured. Mm. And we're gonna have to kind of rethink our own paradigm. For years and years, we would say, hey, you can't be a captain unless you've got 5,000 hours. You can't be a co-pilot unless you've got 3,000 hours. Those days are over. So now we're having to look at less experienced personnel and try to reach the same level of safety with that new you know, um, group of people. Yeah. And, and it'll be a challenge. So we talked about you being a pilot. You have more than 11,000 flight hours. What are your favorite jets? So I was, so I, I've, in, in, the, in business aviation, I flew the Falcon 7X. So the reason I like the Falcon 7X is because when I was in the military, I flew the F-16. The F-16 has a side stick, it's got a lot of thrust, it has a heads-up display. So the first time I got into a Falcon 7X, all I was looking for is where I could call up a missile, you know, and I couldn't see this, yeah, it was just it yeah. was fun to do. But yeah. my favorite plane is I flew the A-10, mm -hmm. 1,500 hours during the Cold War in Europe and got to fly it all over Europe at 500 feet. That still remains my fondest memory. It was a lot of fun, the camaraderie was great. Really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, well, wonderful. Well, thank you for your service. Yeah, my well. pleasure. Thank my you pleasure. for this conversation. This was wonderful. I hope You're you enjoy the rest of the show. Me, me too. Yeah. And as you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here.